Okay, so I think we're ready to go. Um, so hello uh, again. I guess I will state the date since now that I know it. It is August 3rd. It's Saturday. We're in Baltimore City, Maryland. We're in Harlem Park. It's Artscape Weekend. It's a big weekend in Baltimore. Um, I'm Hannah Lane and I work at the Maryland State Archives. And we are doing this interview in partnership with a wonderful program uh, in partnership with the Harlem Theater. This is the West Baltimore Imagination Aroused Oral History Interview. We're going to have a conversation together. Um, so, can you please state your full name and the year you were born? Gladstone Hutchinson. I was born June 18, 1960. I go by Flooney, F-L-U-N-E-Y. Oh, happy super belated birthday. Uh, where do you live now, and where were you born? I was born in Jamaica, um, I in rural Jamaica. Um, I moved around according to where my father and my mother were working. One was a policeman and the other was a nurse, according to where they were located. America is very familiar to me because six months a year my mom would come to the United States to clean houses, you know, and my dad would come to do some kind of a work, you know, but that was just the nature of growing up in a country that wasn't very wealthy, you know, and I myself came to the United States in 1979 on an athletic scholarship and, um, and you know, I have you know, I, I will confess that the United States is a place that I most value living in. You know, I have the opportunity to live in a number of places. My wife is from Germany. I can be an EU citizen. Um, I can be a Commonwealth citizen. And I prefer to be an American citizen among all of those things. What did you, what sport did you play? I played soccer or football. and um, and. You know, I, it's the only thing I brag because nobody can see now because I, I'm too big and fat, <laughs> but I'm actually in the Hall of Fame in my, in my, in my university for my playing. So, and you can tell I have all the scars from it, you yeah. know, but um, I only say that because people say, no, you mean American football? I said, no, I played soccer, you know, but I, it was a thoroughly um, positive experience for me. Not being nosy. What university did you go to? State University of New York, okay. uh, on Ayanto. And if you actually Google, you will see that um, this past May, I was given um, an honorary doctorate in Humane Studies, Humane Letters, for the work I do around the world in, in economic empowerment and economic justice. Wow. So, and I was a graduation speaker. So wow. that, to me, was a great honor because Many faculty there, when I was there as an athlete, they spent a lot of time investing in me outside of athletics. Mm -hmm. You know, they would buy me books, they would have reading sessions, they'd invite me over to their home for dinner to talk about ideas, and they always felt like I could give more than just being an athlete. And so I think for them it was a kind of a just payoff when they have seen me go on to do all these things and then the university choose to honor me with an honorary doctorate in Humane Letters, you know, for the work I have been doing outside of sports. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. So you were born in Jamaica and your childhood is in Jamaica and as a young person you are an athlete in the United States, in New York State. Uh, you live in Maryland uh, now. I live, yes, I live in 675 um, President Street okay. in the view. Um, right. how, when did you come to Maryland and what brought you to Maryland? I came to Maryland in 19, in 2015 as part of Imagine in America National Conference um, and then I was invited back in 2016 um, after the Freddie Gray issue. Um, I could not, I was in the middle of Appalachia working where I was invited in to help them rebuild their economy post coal and um, and I also had gone back to Jamaica. I spent a lot of time in where I work as a either advisor or head of the economy in Jamaica. So I'd gone back there to rebuild 
their downtown Kingston, they had invited me in to come in as a lead advisor to the government to redevelop their difficult area, trench down, you know, all those areas, you know, which had been declared by the United Nations among the most creative economies in the world, although it was completely, you know, just like you have the black art entertainment districts in Baltimore, which is just filled with so much potential, but was just not achieving its promise. So I was, I spent 2017 there, and then I came back, finished up my work here 19, 2019 through 2023 um, in Baltimore, and now I'm working in Moldova. So, yeah. During your first visit in 2015, Yes. What were your impressions of Baltimore? I know that conferences can be really busy, so maybe you didn't get to spend so, so much time, but I'm curious, what did you think? Well, it was a different kind of conference. Its headquarters were at UMBC, but also we had a number of sessions at the Art Social Club, right? And um, so my impression was more at the Art Social Club, where we would go walking. And I was struck by when I went on what is now called North Carey Street there. I was struck by the really good looking townhouses that were all boarded up. And I said, this is weird. Normally when you see boarded up townhouses, it's because they are in a state of disrepair. I said, why? And they said, well, they can't get people to live in them, pay the rent because of the environment. And at the same time, they don't want people to break into them and smoke crack and burn, burn them down. So they were boarded up, you know, even though they were pristine, beautiful roof, marble steps, you know, everything was beautiful. And so that was a contradiction for me. That's when I became curious as to why you, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it was just, it wasn't a rundown, it wasn't rundown, it just was yeah. boarded up. I think that this neighborhood has some of the, I mean, Baltimore has many neighborhoods, uh, many beautiful neighborhoods with slightly different, but still special townhomes, but I think one of my favorites is Harlem Park, the one that's yes. around here. Gorgeous. Yes, yes, I know. It's, I know. It is confusing. I know. Uh, Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, which is where, for people who might watch this in the future, that's where the Arch Social Club is. Right. Uh, it's such a stark contrast what it looks like today yes. from what um, I understand it looks like yes. even in the 1960s. I'm sure you've heard a lot about uh, how Pennsylvania Avenue and like how West Baltimore largely contributed yeah. to culture of Maryland and I would yes. even say the United States. Like, yes. what, do you, what do you think about it as like you've learned about the history of West Baltimore? Yeah. Well, when I was invited in, I was invited in to rebuild that square, right? To rebuild from there to, because that square, the reason why it is always the point of demonstration, right? It's because if you play basketball, like, um, what's her name again? What's it? Brin. Brin plays basketball. Mm -hmm. Then if you stand on Pennsylvania Avenue, right, looking away from downtown, and you do the basketball defensive crouch, which is one, uh, one knee facing up Pennsylvania Avenue, the other one facing down north, you have cut off all traffic to downtown Baltimore. You have cut off all traffic that wants to go down north or down Pennsylvania. You have just by doing this, you have blocked all the passes to the interior. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's so essential because when you strike, when you when you, when you protest there, you suffocate all life, all commercial life in Baltimore, because it is such a centrality point. And again, you're speaking about the Pennsylvania Avenue, North Avenue yes. intersection. Yes, the Pennsylvania Avenue, North Avenue intersection, mm -hmm. which is, we call it Penn North. Penn North. Right, right. Okay. Oh, that's really, I really appreciate hearing your perspective on that. I feel like I mostly hear uh, a lot of folks who have lived in Baltimore 
their whole life talk about Pennsyl Pennsylvania Avenue, and I've never thought about it that way. It is a strategic point. It is a complete strategic point. It's very connected to downtown. Yes. That's really interesting. And by the way, and that's why we were going to focus there, because it is the, it is the second most trafficked four-way in the entire state of Maryland. Mm -hmm. The only other place that is more traffic is in the center of Annapolis. Mm -hmm. It is the second most trafficked area. So you, can, so, so you can imagine the flow mm -hmm. that goes there, and it's multimodal because it has, it has the trains that come there. Mm -hmm. It has the, the, the cars that go there, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And it has the walk traffic that goes there. And so it, it either is really, really good or really, really bad. Yeah. And that's why it was also quickly became the center of the drug problem. Because the people who want to do drug treatment plants, they build their, 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 their morphine plant and their counseling plant right in Penn North because it is a center of where everybody can reach. So everyone now across Baltimore who as a drug problem or want to be around people who understand their circumstances with their drug addiction, they take the train or the bus to Penn North. So when you are there, you will see people, will, people will, will come in and they see somebody go, oh, what are you doing here? He goes, oh, this is where I come and hang out. Because it, it now creates its own culture of people like me who have empathy for my circumstance. Yeah. So even if I'm not buying or selling, it's a place where I don't have to explain myself. You know, and so it's an entire culture that is created there. Yeah, and when you go there, you see continuous police cars, right? Flashing the light, flashing light, flashing light, flashing light, flashing light, just trying to keep order, right? And the last thing I'll say is the Art Social Club, because you just heard me talk about trust. So you will notice no crime, no transaction, no killing, no murder ever takes place in the Penn North area and nothing ever takes place outside the Art Social Club because they have a social contract, they have a covenant with the folks there. We will give you a bathroom on the first floor for you to clean yourself up as long as you keep it clean. We will call the ambulance if someone has a drug problem. We will do this, we will do that. And so with that, every, when we go there for four years, no matter how desperate someone's situation is, they see us, and they go, oh, you're trying to get there? Come, let me take you. Hey, they're here. You know, I listen to my students, perfect. My car, not, we have big limos, never once touched for four years. That was the covenant that was made. So even in the most difficult situation, there's a rationality that people do to preserve the respect that has been shown to them. Yeah. Since 2015, you can believe it, it's almost been 10 years, uh, what, what are some things, what are some changes you've seen? Uh, out of, uh, maybe in terms of like, what are you physically seeing with your eyes or like what kind of feelings, if that makes sense? Like how, what kind of changes have you seen and sensed in West Baltimore over the last nine years? Okay, so it's an unfair thought for me because most probably most of I can't separate my learning versus what has changed because s since then I have invested myself in being a student of Baltimore and West Baltimore and that then meant that I as I have gone into corridors where I have now learned things which I didn't know before so I don't know if I can say oh that's something new that has happened as much as it is I'm learning this and many of, it, many of the stuff I learned through my student eyes. When I saw, I described here, the woman who cried that she couldn't sell her property, right? That was my students who were engaged in her and then brought her out to come and meet with me. Because I didn't believe that in 2023, 2022, 2023, you still had on deeds that the property should not be sold to a black Jew, Muslim or poor white you could be arrested. <laughs> I couldn't believe that in 2023 it's still existing. So I had to research it and see that it still exists. 
And I said to the senator, you gotta be kidding me. I mean, psychologically, why don't you have a bonfire? And I asked him this, have a bonfire and burn all these things as signaling the end. You can't expect a person of color to buy a home and the deed says that you're illegal. But it is part of, yeah? It is still part, and that tells me something about the dynamic, yeah? It tells me something about the extent to which people are organized and pushing back for the things that are psychologically harmful, you know? But what has changed? Okay, so Dennis Johnson, and in, in fact, I gave you the, uh, in, in my packet, right? Yes. There's an article that explains how it happened. She hunted me down. She asked me from 2015 to come in. I told her no, I was very busy. She, 2016, she chased me everywhere I was going around the country giving presentations. I go to California, I go to here, I go to here. She's there. She goes, when are you gonna come? When are you gonna come? She just, I mean, I couldn't get rid of her. So finally I said, okay, we will come and do a due diligence. So if you go on YouTube and you type in building community in Baltimore, you will see the YouTube video, which, what's his name, um, who, chair, who, who, who chaired our session today. Um, was, huh? You chaired the session? Yeah, what's his name again? In the... It was on the microphone? Yeah. Peter? Yeah. yeah. Peter, Peter taped it and put it and posted it on YouTube, right? Yeah. And, and it's... And it, and it's that was my first time coming to West Baltimore with Professor Harris, right? Who he and I have worked a lot since 1996. Mm -hmm. And so we brought in Professor Harris, myself, I brought in my daughter, right? You know, and, um, and my son-in-law, right? You know, who both live here, right? And, um, and I brought in um, Rico Collins, who's a senior vice president of PNC Bank. Right? One of my students who had worked with me in Washington, D.C., right? And um, we spent some time looking around, and, and we said, and I said to Inuit, I said, I've never seen a place more fascinating. I've never seen a place with more potential. We have worked all over the world, and we have never seen a place with so much promise. That was my first impression after just being here for three, four hours. Just come, because we walked Pennsylvania Avenue and we immediately recognized its architecture and the culture of that architecture. It was supposed to be, you know, stores on the first floor, people living above it, you know, kids playing around in little side areas. I mean, we know that structure. So we, so we looked at it and we said, my gosh, you know, right? And so, you know, we were looking the empty lot for kids playing and we would see some parents walking with their kids, going to the supermarket, this and that. And we were like, we know this culture. We know how this builds community. We know how it awakens community. So when we had that meeting that night and they invited the entire community to come out and to challenge us, that's what Denny's invited, that was a call. Come and challenge these economists. Come and challenge. And so <laughs> they had around 45 people oh, no. who came out to challenge us. I love that. Right? Oh, yeah. Very oh, yeah. And, and as you can tell, I love that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> and here's Professor Harris, who's a big time professor from Stanford and this and that, right? And, but then there was an irony of it. A third of the people who came out didn't come out for West Baltimore to challenge. They came out because they knew of the fame of Professor Harris, and they came out to sleep in person. They couldn't, and they're like, we can't believe that, you know, oh my gosh, you're the one who predicted the, the, the shortcomings of the Third Industrial Revolution in your book, you know, Capital Accumulation and, uh, and, and Income Distribution, you know, and, uh, and bah, Capital Accumulation, and blah, 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 you know, and, and so a, a third of the folks there were like, oh my gosh, you know, can you sign the, your book for us? Can sign book for us? So it was a, and then, and then the folks were looking on saying, who is this guy that people have, you know, are and then they realized that, you know, he was extraordinarily special, 
you know, right? I mean, so anyway, I walked away from that meeting, right? And Professor Harris and I then stayed and we walked the entire Pennsylvania Avenue the next morning. It was 81 then. We walked in, the entire walk. We just walked and just looked and talked and talked and talked and talked. That's what we did in Jamaica. We walked the market district and we sit and we talk because we really believe in getting out there and getting the feelings out. And we just thought it was great. And so if you look in the report, go to the, 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 bottom, the, one on, the one on West Baltimore, you will notice that the first page is a picture of Professor Harris with the, um, the, uh, the, the, the Sambe, who is the chairman of the Art Social Club, in the Art Social Club, having a discussion about Pennsylvania Avenue. And then he also outlines what he thought was the, pro you know, how West Baltimore could thrive. You know, right, based on, the, you know, this person has advised 15, 16 countries around the world, you know, right? So anyway, we just, I would say the biggest thing we see now is what you see here, right? Denise brought us in to be her vehicle. She and her group, John and Marion and everybody else, they were agitating for a long time, but they didn't have a vehicle to be heard. They didn't have a vehicle to, 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 to synthesize the information, yeah. to direct the information, and to then use it to do things. So we understood that we were coming in as a vehicle. So I was the chair for the first year just to establish its credibility and then flip it over. And she then chaired it for the next three years. And the council, we reported to the council, you know. And um, she was a, well, you see what Denise is like, right? <laughs> she's, a, she's a powerhouse. She's a, you know, but she's bright. She's really, really bright. She's the best community organizer I've ever worked with. Everywhere I go, I have to have an anchor institution that I work with, right? And she is the best I've ever worked with, you know, and she just, and, we, and it has had tremendous stuff. You know, Wanada, which has now been formed, West, West Avenue, the North Avenue, West North Avenue Development Authority, which is a legislative arm, you know, I mean, she's very influential in that, you know, she's very, you know, the, uh, the, the, the mayor's office, everyone reaches out to her for these things. And so, yeah, and she's nationally, she drives a project, um, you know, and so she's a really powerful person to have in this space. Uh, we mentioned uh, the individual who's kind of chairing today's program, um, Peter, and that is Peter Calloway Brooks. Right. <laughs> Moving on. Um, so I just want to ask uh, briefly about... And everyone knows his history, right? Um, I'm, I'm actually not sure. No? No one knows, one knows his history? All right. Okay. Now. So you should know his history, right? Peter Calloway is the grandson of Cab Calloway. Uh, who, who is a, who is, yeah. <laughs> He's the grandson of Cab Calloway. Right, yeah, right, and so that's it. and you know so and you know, and you know who Cap Calloway is, oh, right? Yeah. yeah. So he's yes. so he's a grandson of Cap Calloway. And uh, the Calloways lived in a, in a part of West Baltimore, yes. a little yes. bit more north. Right? Yes, yes, uh, yes. He was, he played a role in advocating for the Calloway house to yes. not be that's good. Tore down. Yeah. I don't. Was it destroyed? Yeah, I think in the end it may have. Been, it, yeah, in the end. But they still have given, um, they have donated uh, 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 some other houses okay. on Pennsylvania Avenue. That's beautiful. Yeah. Wonderful historical jazz connection to West Baltimore, one of many, but I will not digress in that. Direction. Right. <laughs> right. Um, I wanted to ask uh, about the, the Highway of Nowhere. I have a lot of time for, right? Sings a song that says, um, Every person thinks their burden is the heaviest. Who feels it knows it. So West Baltimore can never get over the hurt and the trauma that the highway to nowhere did to them. But so too can any of the communities, the 23, 24 communities across America who also had highways destroy their lives. And they all had one thing in common, they were vulnerable communities. Now, if you think of what the highway to nowhere was supposed to go and why it's called the highway to nowhere, it's because when it came upon organized citizens, 
it could not continue. That's why it, it is a highway to nowhere. The cart was supposed to go all the way through, but it was not able to go through because they came up on an organized citizenry that blocked it. That's why it had to end and shut off and cut back down. So when I first came here in 2015, right, they had just then, um, no, it was still, you go and it just drops off, right? And the, and the roads on the side were coming into it. In 2016, when I came back, I wanted to show my daughter, but now they had opened it up, right? But it, they had not thought through the logics of it. So the same, so the parking lot that we parked in, we parked in to show them. And in the 20 minutes that we were there, we experienced three accidents. And the neighbors came out and said, oh, yeah, every day at least 10. But well, what was happening was that because they had not thought it through carefully, people were coming off the hill at too much of a blind spot for people driving through. So when they're trying to cut across, they couldn't see their blind spots as they're cutting across, they were getting all these accidents. And the ambulance would come and say, ah, yeah, it's our third call for the day right here, right? But it looks like they have figured it out now. The, the point I'm making is, last night we were there, when we go there, it's a, when they make it be a multimodal hub, that would be the basis of Baltimore City Recovery, where people now can travel from as far as D.C. to come to an event, right? To come to an Orioles game, come to, a, 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 come to all the restaurants downtown, come to, we're going to put in a performance center right there, you see it in the, in the report, come to events there, we're going to put in all these wonderful restaurants right there, come to, in other words, you can open up Baltimore, so you could now have all your taxis, not taxis, your, your Ubers, and your this and that, and your Uber center, and your train station there where people can park, and they can take a scooter, they can go park there, and they could go all over, right, to go work. You, you open up Baltimore, right? Think about it. Right now, they're building all these apartments downtown Baltimore for middle to low income people who work in the restaurants and work in the, in the, in the lower income sectors there. But they live in Baltimore County. They live in these other, in Howard County, they live in these counties and they then, so because it's too difficult for them to be traveling back and forth, back and forth. They're building these apartments now downtown for them. But just imagine if Mart Station was <laughs> opened up and they could now live. They are working there and they could now live. They buy these homes. That's how I was telling you about how we can, we can, we can rebuild without gentrifying. Because the same way that you're building now these apartments here, you could just be modernizing and fixing up and building neighborhoods. And rather than apartments, they have townhouses, and they have parks, and they have this, and they have that, and they can connect. So my answer to what do we think about the highway to nowhere, it can be the highway to human flourishing. It could be a highway to the, the return of prosperity. The idea that all those schools around it are such in such poor state and poor performance. You know, even right across from it, the school is closed down. We believe it has such enormous potential to do it. And that's what I believe in. I, for even now, I drove it again, drove it again, and I deeply believe in it. I deeply believe in Baltimore. That's why I live here. I, I really, really believe in Baltimore's future. Yeah? Yep. What is something you wish that people who do not live here could know about Baltimore? People have a lot to say about Baltimore, I know, you know. What, what's something you, you wish they could know? Um, I, wish they would, I wish they could experience how culturally rich it is. So, okay, what do I mean by that? Part of why I love Baltimore, so for example, both of my daughters, right, when they were choosing their colleges, it was important for them to go to colleges where they would wash out, we say, where, they, where their race would be insignificant. 
So my older daughter went to NYU where nobody could tell her whether she was Hispanic, Indian, Muslim, you know, Italian, <laughs> right, you know, and she just gave her a kind of a freedom. My younger daughter went to Washington University at St. Louis where the same thing, yeah. you, you just wash out, right? When I come to Baltimore, the first time I came to Baltimore, it was the first time I washed out. Kids were squeezing their mom's hands saying, Mom, I think that is Ba Ba Ba, who is a lineman for the Ravens. Can I get his autograph? <laughs> and the mom is like, I don't think it is. She goes, yes, Bob, it is, it is. <laughs> All right. So the, I don't think I was for the Orioles or for the Ravens. <laughs> you know, but I just completely washed out. I sit across in the park, you know, because I live in the view, right? I sit across in that park and you get all these poor athletes who are just sitting there. You know, one guy drives in his beautiful car and his pants falling off and I go get an ice cream. He goes, man, my wife, t her friends are over and she tells me go get ice cream. So I said, the guy goes, so you want to get ice cream with me? I buy you ice cream. I go, I thought I could get ice cream. He says, you don't understand, man. If I get ice cream and go home, she's going to get mad. She wants to hang out with our girls, man. You know, I just got to eat ice cream. So <laughs> we, sit in, we sit over there with the dude buying us ice cream and we're just eating. But it just, and then my student from Saudi Arabia, who now is working there, the first, as you know, the first, a, a couple of the, a lot of Saudi Arabians and Middle Eastern live down there because it is their, it is what they use to their territory health care. You know, so rather than them trying to invest in trying to have cancer research and this or not, this or this or not, they use John Hopkins Hospital. You know, that's how they prioritize it. So they're there and then, so I got to know all of them, you know, right? Because they would talk to my student and this and this and that. But I was in this space where I just could be invisible unless I wanted to be visible. And I said, wow, that's so cool. For the rest of my life, I spend being visible and I have to lock myself away to be invisible. You know, you teach at a school where there's not a lot of faculty of color, you are, I know I'm in Appalachia where, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, I travel to Moldova, you know, I, you name it. But there, I could be invisible. And there was a sweet culture to it in the way how everyone kind of just Baltimoreans are friendly and they like to hear your story and tell you stories. You know, I mean, and so I just go sit down and people will come and just, can I join you? And we feed pigeons and we just talk by the Under Armour place, you know, which is where I go and have breakfast in the morning, you know. And so I would say to people, you know, it's the kind of place where you can just concentrate on the person's eyes. Nothing else. Just are their eyes cheerful, friendly, you know, embracing. You don't need to worry about anything else. How they look, their sexual preference, what you think it is, what it is, why it is, why it is. I mean, my funniest story is I'm walking and there's this early 20s woman who's walking and her dog has on pink socks and she has on pink gloves, right? You know? And so I have dogs, so I look at the dog and I said, nice dog, right? And so she looks at me and she says, you know, you seem to only like certain kind of bitches. <laughs> I'm like, how do I respond to this? <laughs> you know? How do I respond to this, right? And she just looks at me and she just laughs and walks off with her dog. You know, and I'm like, anything I say, I'm going to get in trouble, right? But, and she knew it was, you know, she was just having fun, yeah. right? And I really enjoy that, you know, I, I just, I really like Baltimore, you know, but it's not just downtown. I like my, I like by the Penn North, you know, I spend a lot of time there, you know, um, I like, obviously, I like Denise, you know. Denise and I uh, spend a lot of time, you know, together. Um, and um, 
you know, Senator Hayes, we spent, you know, we spent a lot of time. I, I like its promise. It just, it's like a trying train that hasn't gotten to that mountain top yet where it can make its pursuit of its flourishment be downhill. It still is, you know, trying to get to that point where it's easier, you know, but, but they're trying, you know, they're trying, you know, and they have, they have not given up and they have not resigned and left. The people who I have met four years ago are still here fighting. Even if they're, but they're still here fighting. So, but I, I love Baltimore, you know, I mean, and I'm happy to, to I mean, my next big project, which is gonna be global, I, I will probably take early retirement and just work from here because all of the places that I'm working with from the BWI, it's the most efficient airport to travel from. It's closer than any other airport in the US that I would like to be in. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, and, I, and it's just like 10 minutes, 15 minutes from my, from my condo. So for me, it's just, you know, yeah. So, but, but I'm happy to be here. And I'm, I, I, as you can tell, I come and I enjoy these kind of exercises because I enjoy agitating about Baltimore's promise. You know, I enjoy agitating about it because I believe that it is the agitation and the contestation that allow us to come to some clarity on what is good because our needs are greater than our resources so we have to figure out how do we prioritize and that's a hard thing but you have to you know I mean especially you know I mean I think for art people right in all of my projects I work most of the people who work with me are from the creative side right and I will have a few engineers and economists because engineers and economists know boundaries the people in the creative side of the human mind is boundaries are porous. So if I want to have us imagine or move beyond rationality, then I have to have humanities and creators and, and ideators because they're the ones who say, why not? And I feel differently and I want to push differently. Otherwise, all I have is my engineers that will say, this is it, Here is, this, is, this is our given, this is all we can do. And and we don't change anything, you know? And so I appreciate what you guys do. You know, uh, my big work in Moldova, is the, the most important person, it was my, um, was my social media person, you know, who is teaching social media to, you know, Moldovans how to use it to have voice, you know? And, um, and I think without that, everything else would fail. You know, the economics would fail because we would never imagine beyond the boundaries of Soviet control. They could never imagine what it is to be, to have liberty, to have freedom, because they've never had it in their history. So they, they have no ability to imagine it or conceptualize it. So, you know, I, and I feel the same way about Baltimore. I love what's his name. From the from the municipal, municipality, was it the next to you? Oh, right. Uh, um, yeah. Friendin yeah. Uh, with yeah. The yeah. I I, I I love him. I, yeah, I, I love him, but he will never lead Baltimore. He will never lead Baltimore into its future, because he will only understand to maximize within what is. You know, nothing negative about it. It's just that you need free-range chickens who don't know who are willing to be rangy to challenge and to push and then force him to respond to it he can't set the tone he can't set the boundary he has to react to other people who are challenging the boundary you know and that's why I said to him I like your first point I didn't like your second point I was very deliberate in trying to say to him because the, the, the second point said was too deliberate, like you now, I, now you're just gonna set out now the things that you want to do and let people react to it. You know, I'm like, you don't get to do that. You gotta let the, you know, and um, 
but he's a good guy and I think it's just the idea that you need more of a you and the, the aggregation of a you and the Denise these are people who are kind of really punching the boundaries punching it and forcing the government to say okay 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 because I mean I know Brandon Scott you know he's a good guy but you gotta push him you know otherwise he stays within that space right mm -hmm. so anyway that's I've done enough talking yeah <laughs> thank you so All much right. for sharing your thoughts yeah no, you you could sit there and listen to me talk for hours. There's a difference, right? You haven't said anything. Although there you were quite talking, but now you just do that. But I'm good, you know. Uh, I'm good. I I what I, I go back Monday to my to Pennsylvania, which is where I teach, and then I I think I go to Nigeria a little bit before school starts, and then. I probably go there a couple more times, you know, as I try to get this. And if you believe Baltimore is hard, try that one. Try to get 48 African countries to yeah. come together. Perspective. You know, where it's, but the same thing, disparate interests, trying to motivate, you know, and, um, and I don't, you know, yeah, I mean, I know we're done, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I, and, 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 and yeah, yeah, we're done, and, and, and I think, 